up and actually forgot to open my webcam. Hi. Um, the webinar today uh, will focus on actually two things. So we've, of course, you all are quite well acquainted already with energy communities and discussing energy communities with your with regulators, with public authorities, with uh, um, even funding bodies. Robust business models and clear regulatory frameworks is what is needed, right, to move forward for energy communities, energy communities to be fully recognized as market players and to access financing. So business models and regulatory frameworks. And this is exactly what we'll be looking into today what progress has been made on both these fronts. So let's introduce our speakers now. We have online and connected Ian Steichol from the European Commission, DG Energy, who has been following the energy communities pieces in the clean energy package. He will be providing an overview of the latest um, EU pieces of legislation influencing the development of energy communities. So following this first overview, I'd like to welcome Anja Ratnig from the Austrian Climate and Energy Fund. Uh, she will present her organization and how they are currently funding energy communities in uh, several regions in uh, Austria. The third presentation will be from Pasquale Mota from the engineering consulting company Demepa. He was one of the technical leaders of the Pegasus project, so he will be providing a quick overview of the results from this project and particularly regarding the financial viability of microgrids and coming out from the simulations made in this project. And then we will move directly to a case study. Uh, Lefteris Giacomelos from the Energy Agency of Greece, CRES, will be presenting in more detail the microgrid scenario from the Mega Evidrio community. He's actually presenting this uh, from the from the Varsala municipality, where is the, the actual microgrid site. So uh, we'll have a live coverage from the scene. Uh, webinars have never been more exciting. Yeah. So um, I'll remind our speakers that uh, 10 minutes per speaker. There will be a Q&A session after each presentation. OK. And uh, of course, uh, you are uh, most more most than more than welcome to ask your questions during the presentation as well i will record the questions and i will ask them to the speakers okay so maybe let's move now to our first uh, presentation uh ian you can turn on your webcam and share your screen screen and the floor is yours thank you very much uh, yeah. So just share your screen and your webcam. Yeah, I'm just trying to get this into presentation mode. Yeah. yeah. You can see the screens. My presentation. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, 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 I know. Up one second. Sorry about that, and uh, good morning. 
As we said, my name is Jan Stein. I work at the European Commission in DG Energy, and I'm in Unit uh, for Renewables. And in my presentation today, I would like to give some of the context in which uh, the development of this energy communities legislation took place, and look more specifically at the legislation of energy communities, and then mention some of the next steps. So the big context, of course, are the, the uh, energy climate objectives that we have for 2030. And for 2030, the member states and the European Parliament agreed on greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction of at least 40%, a share of renewable energy of at least 32%. It's important to note that this is the entire energy consumption, not only electricity. 32% share of renewable energy implies probably 50% of renewable electricity. And then, of course, the energy efficiency target. All of this happens also against the backdrop of the Paris Agreement. If you look, in order to reach these targets, we, uh, we developed the Clean Energy Package. The Clean Energy Package uh, is a set of legislative and non-legislative instruments that are meant to translate these high-level objectives uh, so that, that we can actually reach them. This package is built on three things. Um, energy efficiency first, on Europe, visa in renewables, and hopefully in consumer empowerment. And these three, these three pillars are reflected throughout the entire package. So now looking more closely at consumer empowerment. Consumer empowerment, of course, is on one hand quite a general principle. But we've also seen that in member states that already have energy communities, they can be very effective in increasing public acceptance, especially for new renewables projects. And public acceptance is going to become, uh, it already is an important challenge for the development of renewables. And this challenge will only become more important in the next decade. Then we also see that energy communities are a very good tool to a very good tool to mobilize private capital for the energy transition and especially in the case of citizen energy communities uh, they can increase visibility in the market. Now these are only some aspects of the benefits that energy communities can bring. They can of course move a lot more non-tangible benefits as well such as a sense of belonging for the participants of the communities. Okay, so I, I uh, start receiving comments that the audio is not very good. I'm just going to uh, stop for one minute, uh, Ian, if you can, and I'll uh, try to fix it in one second. Yep.
Okay, can you hear me better now? Yes. Very good. Yes, we can hear you perfectly now. Sorry okay, for that. Good. It's it always happens. Sorry. Go on, please, Ian. Thank you. Good. So I'll continue. Um, so this was why I explained why consumer empowerment is important for us in the context of the clean energy package. And now, after this introduction, I'll move to more concretely what we actually proposed in the con in the uh, clean energy package on energy communities. Energy communities appear twice uh, in the package. Once in the electricity directive, the directive on the internal market for electricity. So that's article 16 on citizen energy communities. And then in the renewable energy directive, there we have article 22 on renewable energy communities. In both directives, you find article two on the definitions. And this is a very important, uh, this is important to read because when you read it, it becomes clear that this concept of energy communities in European legislation is a lot more about um, the about the social makeup of those communities and who who members are than about technical aspects. It's more of a social concept than a technical concept. We often get the question of what the difference is between renewable energy communities and uh, citizen energy communities and why they're regulated in two different pieces of legislation. Mm. Let me start uh, with the purpose of the different purpose of both um, types of communities. The renewable energy communities are regulated in the Renewable Energy Directive and they have a clear purpose to foster the up uptake and the deployment of renewable energy sources. This is why they're there. And this is why they are not only for electricity, but for all sources of re uh, renewable energy. Where probably the, uh, at the moment, renewable electricity in many cases is probably practically the most interesting one. Member states uh, will need to put in place a favorable, fra a fa favorable framework to promote um, these communities. They need to address barriers. They need to put in place an enabling framework that also addresses questions of financing and the accessibility of these communities to um, citizens living in vulnerable households. Member states will also need to take into account um, renewable energy communities when they design their support schemes so that uh, renewable energy communities have their special characteristics are considered in the support schemes if necessary. And they are limited geographically because they need to happen around in geographical proximity to where the project happens. This is linked to their objective of increasing public acceptance. Citizen energy communities, on the other hand, are only dealing with electricity. And the criteria for this are much less strict because the electricity in the electricity uh, directive, the electricity directive recognizes different market actors. And as such, it just recognizes citizen energy communities as one of the actors that mustn't be discriminated against. Here you have an overview of what that could mean in practice. Another question we often get is whether energy communities can act as the DSOs, distribution system operators. And this, this will depend on the member state. Member states can decide whether they want to grant uh, citizen energy communities the right to manage distribution networks. And if they do, then renewable energy communities can also, in principle, act as DSOs. So it will depend on the national legal framework. In any case, DSOs will have to cooperate with the energy communities. And then as a last point, 
I'd like to show the difference between um, different concepts of these communities and how they sit together with possible national um, implementation. So it doesn't come out as an, uh, in an office presentation, but I hope you still get the idea. On the left hand, we see uh, citizen energy communities are in the lower field and the electricity directive, they're quite broad, they're very inclusive, but there's not many privileges to attach to it. And then you have the concept of renewable energy communities on top of that. But these two concepts, they are the ones that need to be uh, implemented in member states, but member states can also try different other forms of communities. They can develop national models. They can develop national mo models that are much broader, you know, national models that include uh, industry, that where you have smart grids or microgrids with industry, big industrial players and households where you optimize uh, electricity flows or where you develop uh, more possibilities of sector integration. Those are very interesting models that can, of course, exist in parallel to the communities as they are defined in European legislation. And those models can be much wider than what uh, European legislation provides or much more restrictive as well. So can, uh, can take all, all forms and shapes as long as the European legislation is transposed, other things can exist around it. For the next steps, at the moment it's in the European directives and now member states have until 2021 to transpose our legislation. So in the case of the renewable directive, they have until the end of June 2021 and for the electricity directive, it's a little bit earlier, it's in January 2021. So member states are now starting to develop uh, their national legal frameworks so they are ready to for the transposition dates. Some member states are more advanced with this than others but I think many of them are still working on finding the optimal optimal transposition in their national context. Because you also mentioned financing in the beginning so financing here is included in, in, in the enabling framework of the renewable energy communities. So this will only enter into force once the legislation enters into force. But of course, from the European Commission side, we will continue, the, um, continue supporting this. We are looking at possibilities perhaps through regional funds. This is not yet clear though, and also through the uh, Horizon 2020 programs and research programs. And that, that's it for a short overview and introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, overview and sorry for the technical problems in the beginning. So do we have any questions at this stage from the participants? Uh, I haven't seen any in the chat box, but as always, I have questions. Uh, so uh, while people uh, build the courage to ask their questions, I'll um, ask mine for now. So you were mentioning member states in, uh, transposing these directives. Can you maybe share with us some good practices in terms of enabling frameworks? Because um, in accordance to the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, there are enabling framework. Member states are required to develop some enabling frameworks for energy communities, and this is included in the National Energy and Climate Plan. It should be included. I'm saying. Uh, can you share any good practices and member states who are maybe ahead of others and maybe uh, uh, should be should be followed? At the moment, it's probably a bit too early to do that because 
yeah, some member states are perhaps a bit more advanced in different uh, parts of the transposition of uh, these provisions, but at the moment, most of them are still working. So we want to foster best practice exchange among the member states on this through the different formats that we have to do that. But I think it's a bit too early to now say this or that member state is particularly good or particularly bad. I think most of them are still in the process of developing it. And they, to be fair, they still have the time to do that as well. Okay, and before going to the questions from the participants, I see we're starting to receive some. Um, from your from your opinion in these enabling frameworks, it's just a follow-up question on my first one. What should they be focusing on? Are there any particular aspects that you think would be crucial for member states to consider when developing these uh, enabling frameworks? Even though I know it's early, but from your point of view, In this respect, the legislation is actually quite clear and it's quite a, quite a broad set of, um, of elements that are mentioned in the enabling framework from social considerations like the inclusion of uh, vulnerable households, but also from including a cost benefit analysis and addressing barriers. And Member states don't have the choice to focus on one of them, they need to do it all. So that's good to know. So we can hold them accountable. Yay. Um, let's move to the um, to the participants' questions. Uh, from Christian Patrick. Um, Ian, you said that member states can have more restrictive forms of citizen energy communities or renewable energy communities but how far can they go to not make it too complicated or restrictive for communities to set up these communities? Oh no, sorry. In that case, perhaps I wasn't clear. They cannot be more restrictive than what's in the le legislation. So what's in the legislation needs to be transposed. My point was just that what we, what we have in our legislation is not exclusive. So if there are other models, you know, that don't meet the very stringent uh, elements of our definition, for instance, but that could still be valuable. Member states are, of course, free to um, free to pursue those and to foster de the development of those as well. But they cannot be more restrictive in, on the European energy communities. They have to be transposed, and they cannot. They cannot say, oh, but we have this mo national model, so we're not going to take care of what's coming from European legislation. That's not possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. We will have a final Q&A session at the end, so maybe we can have some more questions uh, then, okay? So don't hesitate to continue asking them uh, for uh, the current presentation and the next ones as well. Thank you for this first presentation uh, that shows that there's a piece of legislation in place, legal provisions about energy communities, which is a first, which is a big step forward, hence my excitement as well. Let's move uh, now maybe to um, the perspective of um, funding body. So, um, Anya Rotnik, are you... Can you please open your mic? Yes. And I will make you a presenter in just one second. You are now a presenter. And you can share your webcam as well as your slides. Okay, so I hope everything is working. We can hear you perfectly. You can hear me, and yes. is my and screen can see shared? And the screen is now shared, yes. And if you could put perfect. it full screen, it would be just perfect. Ah, amazing, great. The floor is yours, Anya. Okay, 
So, um, a warm hello also from my side. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing to you the Austrian Climate and Energy Fund. And as Philip already mentioned, uh, this means I will bring the whole discussion from a European to a national level. Um, and this is what I'm going to be talking about. So first, um, there will be a very brief introduction about uh, who we are and what we do. But then I would like to um, dive a little deeper into two of our programs, actually, um, because they will be dealing with energy communities. And also we have one concrete example where there is has been a business model evolving from one of our uh, funding activities, which should be very interesting. So the first uh, program is the Austrian Smart Cities Initiative. Uh, and then we also have the climate and energy model regions. So um, the Climate and Energy Fund um, has been set up uh, about 10 years ago. So it was founded in 2007. Um, as you can see in the graphic, our funding budget derives from two ministries, so it's on the graphic on the left side. Um, the first ministry is the Ministry for Sustainability and Tourism, and the other one is the Ministry for Transport, um, Innovation and Technology. So this is where the money comes from, uh, and we are kind of the, the strategy makers. So with our programs, we try to make the best with the little money we get because, to be honest, we don't have a, a huge budget, but still it comes to about 100 million euro that we can distribute per year. Um, and our focus um, is very strong on what has already mentioned by Ian, citizen involvement, citizen empowerment to really get people involved. So awareness is one, one big pillar. We have a uh, focus on mobility, new mobility concepts, uh, energy transition, of course. So there are energy research projects um, that we try to push. And um, regarding climate change, we also have programs that deal with uh, climate adaption because living in the Alps, we already suffer a lot from climate change. So this also uh, is getting more and more important for us. Um, I have brought you this graphic, uh, which summarizes, or tries let, at least, let's say, to summarize all the activities that we are doing. Um, as you can see, we are acting nearly everywhere. So our aim is not only to support energy and mobility projects, but also to, to make them visible. So we have, we have an emphasis on model regions. Uh, as you can see here, climate change adaption and energy model regions. Um, you see the small red uh, dots. These are smart cities. Um, and the blue scratches here, these are electric mobility regions. Um, some hard fact about Austria, maybe also because this is important, how we act um, and how we implement the European legislation in Austria. So we are a very small state. We only have not even 9 million inhabitants. Um, and we are also very small structured. Um, so you will see um, later on when I explain to you our two funding programs, how our structure and our being a small state um, affects our acting. So the first uh, funding program, which is very interesting, or we hope is interesting for you, is the Austrian Smart Cities Initiative. Um, right from the start, we laid an emphasis here on small smart cities and rural areas, because as I explained, we are a very small country and have a lot of, um, a lot of smaller cities and just one mega city. Um, also very important is the definition, what is the smart city, because like everything seems to be smart today, right? Um, uh, it was very important that we um, have a definition that would work and we came up with livable, sustainable and resilient and we try to head in that direction. So within this program, um, we have already implemented more than 100 projects uh, and spent more than eight, 80 um, million euro. 
uh, you can see in the graphic that there is much more going on than just the funding of projects. So the projects, they are in the program Living Urban Innovation. Here the funding of the project takes place, but we have an overall roof, which is the Smart Cities Initiative, and there is much more. So the fund also has activities in um, in education. So we go to schools, we have, um, for example, a youth energy slam. Um, so we are acting on a broader scale, but within this initiative, um, we also fund innovative energy pro uh, projects, yes. Um, always with the aim to bring innovation into real cities and to test them under real conditions. Um, this was another graph just to show how really small our cities are. So we have between 10 and 50,000 inhabitants uh, in most of our cities and it would be a shame to neglect those people uh, when it comes to energy transition. Um, we focus on small cities, um, not only because we have, have a lot of them, but also because there's a lot of potential as we, as we see it. I mean, the disadvantages might be known, they don't have enough financial resources, there is a lack of experienced staff, um, there is very few innovation, but on the other hand, they bring in a lot of hands-on pragmatism, so they really like to do something. They are, they are good collaborations, people know each other, so we wanted to make use of this. Uh, and this is one of our best practice examples, how we could bring in the positive, um, the positive aspects. Um, because in Oberwart, this is the city, the smart city, um, we tried to level out all the weak points and made the, made, made the most of the positive ones. So there are very, it's a very, um, it's a very rural area. You can see there are not even 8,000 inhabitants, but what did they do? We brought them in form, we brought them together in form of a cluster. Um, and since uh, 2012, there have been a few projects going on, um, bringing in digitalization to a very, very rural area. Um, they connected via smart grids, um, a prosumer model. So the people had, for example, PV installations on the roof. They were interconnected with their neighbors. And they also had um, charging stations for electric cars to make a whole circle. So whenever you needed some energy, then you could take the energy from the roof of your neighbor. And this is all um, combined via a blockchain. So they are also working with um, a hub from Graz, which is a bigger city in Austria, um, and try to develop a, a whole little um, system that is working to, to make the region independent from any energy from the outside so they can produce any energy themselves. They have storage facilities, they have the, the smart distribution system and it seems now that they are really reaching uh, uh, um, some good progress uh, and you can visit the Oberwart also if you're interested in next year because they will have um, a demo of this um, of this smart grid project. So um, I could bring in here a lot more other examples for smart cities, but uh, time is running short. So um, I also want to introduce to you the second uh, interesting program we are um, we are having, um, and this is the climate and energy model regions. So all the green dots that you can see here, these are the climate and energy model regions. So uh, again, what's, uh, how does it work? What's in there? We also have um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of projects already implemented. There are already 95 model regions all over Austria and the funding budget in total was over 40 million euro. So here, um, the emphasis is not so strong on innovation. This program is much more about um, getting into action. 
So we have a strong bottom-up approach. Um, the people really in, in, in each community, they can come up with their own ideas about how to transform the energy system, about how to bring forward energy transition, um, which means there is a lot of individuality and flexibility. And they also use, they try to use the most innovative technologies that there are. Yes, but the focus is not on trying out new things like in the smart cities. Here it's really on how can we implement what we already got. So the big goal here is we want to become 100% fossil free in our region. Um, how, does, how does it work? Um, so the first step is um, people need to elaborate an energy concept, which you can see here on the left side. Um, then the mayor needs to agree on being part of the program because the community, so the municipality, needs to pay also, so they need to contribute. Um, and then for the implementation, this is the most important part of the program, uh, the, the region needs to hire a manager. So he will be responsible that everything is done. Very often we have a lot of nice concepts, plans, we want to do things, but when there is not one, peop, one person responsible for implementing all these nice ideas, then very often they get for, <laughs> forgotten or they just lie in the drawer. So we make sure that he gets this concept in his hands and he is responsible to, make these, uh, to bring these 10 activities um, really into action. Uh, the time frame is three years, so our funding um, is, um, there is a limited time frame for three years. In the first year, the concept is elaborated, and in the second and third year, the manager needs to implement it. Um, once the region has been funded, they can apply again for another round of funding too. So we already have regions that have the fourth or fifth round, but they always need to bring in new activities. Um, and this is when you remember in the beginning of my presentation, I told you there would be a, a business model that evolved from our funding activities. It's called Helios. Um, it's very interesting. Um, there are private people who started it. Um, it's a crowdfunding based business model. So they made up uh, a coin, the, the solar coin, the so-called solar coin. Uh, everyone can invest and then Helios um, will install um, PV installations on the roofs of any building that is that that wants to participate. So if you have, uh, like here, you see the the fireworks, or um, you have a very huge roof yourself, you can say you want to be part of the program of Helios. Then they will make the PV installation. You don't have to pay anything. Um, Helios will sell the electricity and after 13 years your reward is that you will get the whole installation for free. Um, this uh, is quite innovative. Um, they have been working on this for three years now and they already have over 400 systems installed with an annual growth rate uh, with about two to three megawatt per year. Um, this is a quite good example for how the model region manager pushed or inspired the people to get involved and to to bring in their own ideas also and to make it also money from it in the end. Um, here are some other activities which we do in the climate and energy model regions. Um, there's a lot of electric uh, vehicles, so new mobility concepts. We have climate schools. Uh, we have um, also re push renewables as a whole and also the restructuring of buildings is um, can be one of these actions, point of actions. Yes, so um, thank you for the attention. I hope I didn't um, overdo my time frame. And in the end, I also wanted to invite you to Austria. If you wanna see uh, our best practice examples for real. There is the Mission Innovation Austria Week uh, in April next year. And in August, the European Forum Alpbach also is a very interesting um, format to exchange ideas, um, not only about energy, but uh, all the important topics, issues that we are discussing right now. Yes, thank you. That's uh, from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Anya.
no no worries uh if the presentation was longer it is very interesting uh to see uh, what type of projects you're funding and also i think i'll quote you on some of the things you said um small municipalities can bring some hands-on pragmatism that's that's uh, actually uh, i'll quote you on that i'll use it <laughs> uh, so we have some <laughs> questions uh I'll, we have some questions uh from our participants uh the first question comes from joanna yes. Salkoto, Koto. i think i pronounced it more or less right and uh her question is regarding your process regarding the manager uh is the manager someone okay. local and how do you choose the manager Okay, yes, um, this is a very important question because it's, uh, yes, it is someone local and we think it's also very important to have someone from the region um, and the process is not, we are not hiring, so we are just funding, but it will be the municipality um, that will, so it's, it's administra the administration of the municipality and the mayor who will, um, who will make the decision finally who is going to be the manager and it doesn't need to be someone born there if you want but it needs to be someone who is locally accepted and this is we have made the best uh, experiences when it's all really coming from the community from there i hope that answers the questions Yeah, it's 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 uh, quite clear to me. Uh, Joanna, feel free to ask a follow-up question if if you want more uh, clarification. The next question comes from uh, Alexia Boulanger. In Freistadt, do you also implement storage systems? What systems? Storage, energy storage. Ah. Okay. Um, so. It's possible, but I don't know. In Fre because as I've told you, Freistadt is one of 95 um, regions that we have, and each region has 10 activities that they focus on. So I don't know by heart which um, which actions every community has chosen for themselves, but it's possible. So like building up storage facilities is something that they can do, um, but it's not um, it's not obligatory. For the Helios, because we, if, if it's working with the, the PV business model, if they have some storage facilities, which I think would make sense, um, I don't know. But if you're interested more in how they work, um, I can give you also the contact, uh, or also you have my contact in the end of the presentation, and ask them right away how do they work in detail for, for the PV installations if they have uh, storage facilities, because I, I don't know if they have. Ah, we have the CEM manager from Freistadt actually uh, responding here. Helios only sells storage facilities. Ah, great. <laughs> great. It is not working so like, <laughs> exactly. It is not working like the PV storage business model. Okay. So okay. we have an answer here. Um, regarding the CEM managers, uh, there's one more question here. Uh, are they working at regional or municipal level? Uh, Alexia Boulanger is asking. Okay, so um, this is a very a little tricky question because the, it depends on how what is what is the the, the energy model region. So region um, means there is at least one municipality, but more often it's two, three, or even more municipalities coming together because this is what we wanted to push that not only what everyone is fighting for themselves alone because but to bring them together and they can apply they can decide on that for themselves how many municipalities will form one model region um so the the handling so the, the administration lies within the municipality but often they share so more municipalities share one region okay thank you for this uh for this clarification we have one more 
one more question from Marie Louise Pearson, but this is, I would say, more more of a horizontal question to be asked, and maybe I'll ask it at the end, uh, Marie Louise, uh, if uh, you agree. What do the net owner think about the local energy communities? Not sure whether you want to comment on this now, uh, Anya, or we can have this. Uh... Yes, so I, I maybe this would be a question we could ask to yeah. the to the yeah. manager from Freistadt himself because I don't know how they how they build up the contracts with uh, the net owner, if how they are how they are interfering. But it's true that this would be a very interesting question. But the technical aspect of how it's working, I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay, Johannes. Traxler, if you want to answer, you can answer in writing uh, or, or take the floor now quickly. Uh, if not, uh, we'll go on to the last question. How many citizens were involved in the Oberwart case? Could you tell us what motivates the most people to be involved and participate in the process? Yes. So uh, in Oberwart, um, also there has been one person who is pushing very much the action, Andreas Schneeberger, um, and he is part, he formed an association. So it's voluntary an association, Act for Energy. It's called. It's and there, in this association, he but he's a private person really. So he he really does it because he believes in the energy transit. He wants to move, bring it forward. Uh, and with this association that he built up, he invited all neighbors, all persons that were interested to be part of it. Um, and they, in, within this association, there are like um, 20, 30 people um, over the years, and they are working together. They're very, they're uh, political um, leaders in it. I don't know. I, they, I don't think the mayor is in it, but some represented some administrative. Um, representatives from the administration are in there, um, also local businesses, uh, and also, of course, a lot of private people who would just want to be part of it. And this association, Act for Energy, um, is, I think, the most important um, push pusher of the project. And they also um, got the funding from us. So the association made the, or a, a apply to the call that we made for the smart cities. Thank you, thank you, Anya. Uh, I think we all have a lot more questions, uh, as always. But we have um, uh, we have we should move to the next presentation now, and we will have a Q and A session right at the end, where we will can ask all our final questions. Um, so. Uh, let's move to the next participant. Thank you, Anya, again for your presentation and for the pitch. Stay with us, please. At the end, we'll have a, a small debate with uh, all the speakers, yeah? And uh, of course, okay. uh, I'll just share this now with all the participants. In, uh, of course, there is a recording of the webinar and all the slides will be presented and the contact details of the speakers as well, if they agree according to GDPR, uh, we'll share them with you as well in case you want to follow up uh, later on, okay? Thank you, Anya. You can turn off okay. your webcam for now and, and stop sharing your screen, and then we'll move to the next uh, speaker, who is Pasquale. Pasquale from the consultant's company, Demepa. Pasquale, I'm just looking for you in, your, uh, in the list of registrants. Yeah, Pasquale. Hey. Can you? Yes, we can hear you. And can you share your webcam and your screen? App. Just. Uh, Add it. Oops. Uh, we're hearing some music, and I'm not sure whether it's from your side, Pasquale, or somebody else's. Okay, so I cut your microphone, Pasquale. There's some music in the background. I can still see you. Uh, can you open your mic now? Yeah. Is the music off?
My name is uh, Pasquale Botta. Hi. I work for the MEPA, one of the partners of uh, Pegasus project, and uh, that uh, is a part of the Interreg, uh, Interreg MED program, co-founded by the European Regional Development Fund. Uh, we can't see your slides yet. Can you share your, your screen with us? Sorry? Can you share your screen with us? We don't see the slides, your presentation. It's not possible to see the screen? Your screen, no, we're not seeing it. You just need to click on uh, share your screen. It's the button right next to the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you now go, perfect. Now we can see it, thank you. Oh, sorry. And we can hear you, everything is perfect. Please, go on. Okay, okay but it will not see you. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. as I said before, <clears throat> I have to task to, to illustrate some of the results uh, achieved in uh, during three years, uh, the last three years of activity of uh, Pegasus project. In particular, mm, the result concerning uh, the financial uh, viability of the different uh, uh, pilot that uh, have been uh, studied and simulated in the project. Pegasus project uh, has the general objective to contribute to an increased efficient and effective use of uh, renewable sources in local territories making use of microgrid technologies. What are microgrid? I think is known, but it is here reported uh, the definition by Department of Energy. Uh, and, uh, in uh, Pegasus project, uh, this concept of microgrid uh, is uh, taken into consideration with uh, a specification. We do not intend to, uh, for the microgrid studied in the project, to uh, have additional infrastructure, electrical infrastructure for distribution of the electricity, but only we think to use the existing one. In this frame, microgrids uh, are is compliant, are compliant with uh, the new European rules on renewable energy communities. Here are referred some of the possibility for the renewable energy communities concerning the electricity generation, distribution, supply, consumption, and any other services to its uh, shareholder members. Coming to the partners uh, uh, of the Pegasus project, uh, there are 10 different partners coming uh, from uh, nine uh, uh, countries, uh, origin countries, uh, here are uh, reported, and they work uh, Worked together 
with uh, the scope uh, to define business model that uh, can uh, that are based on real data uh, for this scope for this purpose uh, the pilot that we discuss uh, before uh, in the following are uh, made are based on data real data measured and stored and achieved uh, for several months in some cases up to one years in order to refer to a real situation not only but uh, uh, it has taken into consideration the real situation for each of the pilot to be taken into consideration. Real situation that means uh, related to the uh, regulation of each territory, of each area. Also, the real situation concerning the price of the electricity, the incentives in the existing to renewables, and so on. The seven pilots developed uh, can be uh, grouped in uh, three subsets. One included uh, public building, uh, housing, uh, uh, intensive energy. The other three concern pilot uh, to be established in Iceland. The third group are related to microgrid in uh, rural regions in France and in Greece particularly. Coming to the first one of the pilot, uh, that uh, developed by the municipality of Potenza. The pilot uh, was aimed to demonstrate uh, the advantages achievable by the Italian regulation scambio sul posto altrove, uh, that uh, allow to consider one, two or more sites uh, public sites uh, as uh, uh, only one users uh, from the electrical point of view under the condition that uh, at least one of them is equipped with uh, renewable sources. In this case, uh, take into account uh, the high request of uh, thermal energy by the swimming pool that is one of the sites of the pilot any driven <coughs> sorry <coughs> cogeneration system able with the power of <coughs> 120 kilowatt from the thermal point of view and 60 kilowatt in electrical terms <coughs> can be used in the swimming pool to produce thermal energy requested for water and ambient air heating. The electricity produced, the contemporary electricity produced, is used in priority way in the swimming pool. The exceeding part is fed into <coughs> the grid. in a complementary way, obviously, when uh, the requested the demand of the electricity is higher the power of the uh, cogeneration system, electricity is drawback from the grid. A picture of the results obtained from this pilot 
in terms of reduced primary energy consumption, of reduced carbon emission, and cost saving for the electric services. In consideration of this uh, cost saving, the total investment uh, here reported of 246,000 euro, totally financed by a bank loan with a considered interest rate of 3%, allowed to obtain a payback of three more, something more than three years, and uh, an internal return rate of uh, about 25%. The important uh, issue to be outlined at this figure in results I induced the municipality for a call for tender for the implementation of the solution implemented or better simulated during the pilot. The second pilot uh, has been developed at the sport park area of the city of Rus in Slovenia. This pilot involves four public buildings. Here reported the electricity consumption and thermal energy used for, sorry, used for for the four public buildings. The pilot includes, or is better, the simulation of the pilot has been considered 100 kilowatt in peak in capacity of a PV plant, able to generate uh, about uh, 100,000 of kilowatt per year. Uh, this measure, uh, this uh, energy, this availability of energy was measured as well the electricity consumption make take advantages of the existing uh, PV plant of two main of the four buildings, the sport park and the sport hall of this area. So, assuming an investment for the 100 kilowatts plant, PV plant, equal to 110,000 uh, euro. Also, in this case, uh, uh, financed by a bank loan. Here reported uh, the interest rate uh, considered in the simulation. And take into account possibility to a lower cost of the electricity in respect of the current tariffs, local tariffs, equal to about uh, uh, 12,000 euro per year. It's possible to achieve uh, the payback net present value and internal return rate here presented. For this pilot has been performed several, uh, several uh, configuration of uh, the potential microgrid and, and has to be taken into account that, that we recorded that in one of this uh, is also considered uh, the use of co-generation system, take into account uh, the uh, high request of thermal energy for the swimming pool, like uh, in uh, uh, the pilot developed at Potenza. In this case, in this situation, uh, 
the financial, the economic and financial frame is not so good uh, because the cost, uh, the difference in cost between the natural gas used to supply the existing boilers and the electricity is quite different from the Italian case and uh, do not allow a good a good uh, balance from the financial point of view. The third pilot to be considered to be developed that has been developed concerns the University of Cyprus. It has developed uh, a pilot that uh, do not use uh, the large quantity of energy of the previous ones. But uh, in this case, uh, it is developed uh, a lot uh, of uh, uh, case, a lot of uh, simulation, a lot uh, of evaluation, very interesting for the developing of the microbates. It is being used uh, a small microgrid concerning uh, the force premises uh, is a laboratory which uh, performs some test uh, on uh, on equipment uh, on software and so on and it includes uh, loads uh, like uh, equipment uh, lighting uh, uh, and uh, other instrument and other laboratory instrumentation <clears throat> to this uh, has been adjusted uh, ad addition a programmable electric load able to emulate consumption profiles also batteries uh, used to emulate uh, an electric vehicle charging station an energy storage system based on batteries and uh, <clears throat> A PV plant, also an energy management system able to control, to measure all uh, the system. This uh, a small microgrid, uh, small because, uh, as I said before, is referred to a quantity of energy lower than the previous one is used has been used as a test bed for the design of the larger microgrid of the university and also to perform to simulate a lot of operating condition of uh, on the microgrid it has to be mentioned to these purposes uh, the definition the study of the transient situation from the passage from a green connected to an island mode operation of a microwave that are very interesting in this pilot has been simulated <clears throat> three different power of a pv to be installed in a microgrid having the same loads of the force premises. The PV plant is associated with one or two or the <clears throat> energy storage system you reported amounting to 30 or 50 Kilo, kilo hour, obviously, not kilowatt of peak. Kilo. Okay. The required investment uh, in this case uh, for the different combination of power plant, <coughs> power, or the PV plant and uh, the energy storage system is in the range from 10,000 up to 50,000 euro. 
the related payback ranges from 50 to from 5 to 19 years. <clears throat> the configuration more profitable is that consists of a microgrid using a PV plant of 15 kilowatts in peak and without storage. This uh, result uh, that is common to the other pilot developed uh, under the project uh, uh, put in evidence that uh, at the moment uh, the cost uh, of the storage system, whichever the type of solution used uh, to store electricity, is too much expensive for a microgrid. I have uh, to... Pasquale? Sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just conscious of time, so I'll just ask you if you could go uh, a bit more quicker to the very sexy <laughs> information of each pilot, uh, just because uh, I'm conscious of time okay. and of the fact that uh, there, it's lunch break for some people and we have one more presentation more in detail as well. So I'm okay. just, just, just going to ask you, continue your presentation, but if you can, uh, uh, if you can focus on some of the most important aspects. Thank you. Uh, one, let me to, to, to present one aspect for this microgrid that uh, is uh, very interesting. It is known that, ma that microgrid, for effect of their uh, local generation, is able to, <clears throat> to reduce the loss on uh, the transmission and distribution grid. Not only the microgrid can uh, uh, defer the investment requested uh, to reinforce uh, a distribution uh, grid or network when in presence of uh, a weak network or when the local load increased during the time. Microgrid is able to defer this investment. The combined effect of these two facts is been, has been evaluated concerning the World University campus of the University of Cyprus and it has been estimated in one million over 20 years. And this is a great advantage for local DSO. <clears throat> The second uh, pilot concerning uh, uh, the microgrid to be installed uh, in Iceland uh, is related, uh, has been simulated uh, in Preco, a village uh, of the island of Uglian in Croatia. In this case, the macro grid uh, includes a 10 kilowatt PV plant installed on the rooftop of an olive oil mill that operates, in this case, as a prosumer, and three public consumers and one private, another private consumer. The electricity consumption from uh, uh, these four consumers equal to about uh, 12,000 kilowatt per year, kilowatt hour per year, is uh, similar to the electricity that can be generated by the, the 10 kilowatt peak PV plant. Take into account uh, solar energy is available only during the day. Uh, two possible solutions can be uh, has been simulated. One of these concern uh, the use <coughs> the use of uh, a, a storage system in 
in order to make available electricity also during the night. But as I said before, this is too much expensive. The second solution is to make use of the net metering regulation that allow to use the, electric the electricity without uh, uh, limitation of time, in other terms, to put electricity into the grid when uh, the production, the generation, overcome the local demand and vice versa to make use of this electricity during uh, the night. Uh, unfortunately, there are no uh, type of incentive of this type uh, in Croatia. And, uh, and uh, this uh, is one of the uh, clear barriers to the development of such kind of, of solution. It is important to underline that uh, in this uh, situation, in this uh, island, uh, there are a problem of security of supply and the microgrid can, can improve, can better the situation, but this I have explained what is the problem. The third uh, pilot concerning uh, the island has been simulated on Gozo Island in the municipality of San Lorenzo. Uh, a municipality including about uh, 700 uh, of, of people, of inhabitants. And uh, it is simulated a community-based matter grid that include uh, eight uh, prosumers and six uh, residential consumers. In presence uh, of uh, several incentives for uh, renewable sources, uh, the prosumer have uh, a total installed TV uh, plant for 54 kilowatt uh, peak and uh, corresponding to a 76 megawatt year of generated electricity. It has been assumed to increase the, the availability of uh, electricity by a further about 100 kilowatt in peak power plant, which corresponds to an investment of 150,000 euro that are being support financed for 75% by a grant and the remaining by the local community. Several scenario has been investigated for this pilot and uh, one of the most interesting of them uh, is based on this assumption. The microgrid purchases all the electricity requested by the prosumer and by the, or, and by the supply. The microgrid purchase electricity, obviously, from the prosumer and from the main public grid. And supply the community members with a rate that is discounted 10% on the local current tariffs. The electricity exceeding the total demand and available into the microgrid is sold at a price equal to the current feeding tariff existing in Malta. The result in terms of a financial index here reported is not very good to take into account 75% of grant financing the investment, but they are in general good and can be improved by optimization 
of the configuration of the microgrid with a, a different number of uh, consumer with different uh, uh, PV plan to be installed and so on. The third one is the pilot uh, concerning St. Julian in Quint uh, my, uh, village uh, that uh, this village we had a problem uh, related uh, to some outage of the grid that uh, don't make uh, available electricity uh, to the cold stores of the farmers and uh, boiler based on chipset uh, used for heating stove. For this reason, the local community, the, the inhabitants of the village and the, their representatives decided to uh, make use of local energy sources. To this purpose, they uh, establish a local community and make use of, in my opinion, most advanced uh, regulation concerning uh, local energy community that is available in, uh, in France uh, starting from 2070 and uh, uh, 70 years, um, two years ago, sorry. And uh, what is the situation, what, what said this regulation? We have a possibility for uh, uh, the consumer to be supplied from two sides. One from the local DSO, as uh, shown in the figure, and the other from a local supplier of electricity, a local provider. And uh, this provider use electricity, use electricity generated by PV plant installed on the roof or similar situation of the house of the of the village. A <clears throat> local cooperative uh, community has been established in order to include 33 consumer that are part of this local energy community and they finance also in part as you can see in follow the investment related to the renewable sources. Very interesting, in my opinion, is uh, the way how to subdivide it or how to take into account the different uh, uh, supply, the dual supply of electricity from the local provider and from the local DSO. As uh, shown in picture, it is clear, it is uh, uh, shown the solution that allow that each consumer make uh, a share of electricity of its electricity from the local provider in the same ratio of the total requested uh, of the total electricity consumed referred to the total demand of electricity. These data are performed over a step lasting 30 minutes and uh, can be used in order to regulate the different, the different bill at the end of the period for each consumer. 
several simulations that is performed also for this kind of uh, microgrid. Having in mind the two uh, very important items. The local cooperative has to be, has to cover the depreciation of this investment and the operating cost of the microgrid through the income deriving from the bill paid by the local consumers. On the other end, the local consumer has to buy electricity at a price lower or equal to the current public tariffs. As I said before, several simulations and this performed, uh, considering the different way in which uh, uh, can be financed the requested 190,000 uh, euro of the investment. In case of uh, uh, this investment is financed for, I remember, uh, 20, 20, 30 percent by the local community and the remaining by bank load. The price paid by the local consumer must be necessarily equal to 20 cent euro per kilowatt. To achieve a price of the electricity equal to the current tariffs, uh, local current tariffs that are uh, around 8 cent euro per kilowatt, Necessarily, the investment by be financed uh, by a grant. This grant must be 60% of the total investment. <clears throat> the last one, pilot of the project. I have finished uh, yeah. a short presentation mm -hmm. of this pilot because I think uh, the theories will be discussed about this. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Pasquale. Thank you. This is the last slide, right? Located uh, in the municipality of Harsala in Greece, and uh, have a peculiarity to be uh, to be extended uh, over a very wide area. It includes a lot of residential houses, mm, most of them equipped. Uh, with uh, PV installation, include uh, also public buildings, commercial buildings, uh, public street lights, uh, water pumping, uh, not only for uh, uh, sanitary water, for uh, potable water, but also for uh, irrigation uh, scope, uh, and include also the some pro five producers for a total of 500 kilowatts. Also, this type of pilot has been simulated and considered as a local energy community participated by all the local consumer and by the municipality of Parsala. As I said before, I think yeah. that there is a better on display. Let's move to, to our next speaker. Thank you, Pasquale. We'll get any, any, any questions we and sorry you might have. For the presentation of the results. Yes, no worries. We're we're moving directly to you, Lefteris, now, in the municipality of uh, Varsala, um, and I'm just going to find you in the the list so that I can make your presenter. Lefteris. Okay, Lefteris, we can hear you from... Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. ...from Greece. Uh, 
you have five minutes. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> but uh, uh, try to keep within the 10 minutes uh, slot if you can, so that we have a, a small session at the end for the Q&A so that uh, people can ask their questions before going to their long-weighted lunch breaks. Please, okay, thank you. raise yours. Uh, my name is Lefteris Giacomelos. I work for CRES, Center for Renewable Energy Sources. And I am here in the in the area of the pilot uh, microgrid uh, of Mega Evidrio. Uh, the area is uh, consists of five settlements, five uh, small villages. You can see them: one, two, three, four, five villages. Uh, it is basically an agricultural community uh, with uh, a very low. Uh, trade level and with no significant tourist activity in the area. So it is a main uh, agricultural area. Uh, in the pilot area, there are houses, public buildings, shops, public pumping stations for water supply, private pumps for irrigation, public lights, and commercial photovoltaics. We have installed uh, 62 energy meters uh, in the buildings of the area and we take data uh, from the meters for every one minute and then translate it th this uh, to 15 minutes uh, uh, consumption. This is the situation before the microgrid and uh, we are going to see the situation after the microgrid. The main difference is the PV systems. Here it is 545 and then after the microgrid, it will be almost 200 kilowatts more to 723 kilowatt peak. The consumers uh, in the area are houses, shops, as we said, uh, public buildings, public street lights, public pumping stations, and station for irrigation. The prosumers, producers, and consumers are five houses with PV photovoltaics on their roofs. Uh, 75 houses with new PV panels that are going to be installed uh, when the microgrid will be ready and one public building with uh, also one photovoltaic in, the, in its roof. Uh, the Greek pilot is going to have one single point of common coupling with the main electricity grid and is going to be organized as a local energy community. Uh, when it is ready, the consumers are going to buy electricity from the main green, main grid. The prosumers will sell electricity to the main grid. Excuse me. This is the situation before the establishment of the microgrid. The consumers buy electricity from the main grid. The producers sell electricity to the main grid, and the prosumers buy electricity from the main grid in a net metering basis. If they produce more electricity than the electricity they consume, they don't earn any money for this surplus of the electricity. This is the situation now. The future situation after the establishment of the microgrid is that there will be an energy community and, and the energy community will operate the microgrid. In the energy community will participate the local municipality, the local residents, the shop owners, the local electricity producers and various other interested parties. The energy community is going to buy the new PV systems, the necessary software and the point of common coupling. And uh, the money for uh, this investment will come from the members of the energy community, from loans and from grants. After the start of the microgrid, the microgrid is going to buy electricity from the main grid and from the producers and prosumers, and it is going to follow a net metering procedure. And the microgrid is going to sell electricity to the consumers and prosumers. In what price? Uh, we consider that the consumers are going to buy electricity from the microgrid with a discount of X percent. We are going to see various scenarios, scenarios with different uh, prices of this X. The producers are going to sell electricity with a premium of Y percent and the prosumers are going to buy electricity from the microgrid and if the production is higher than consumption, they are going to sell electricity to the microgrid at a fixed price of Z cents 
per kilowatt hour. Then metering is going to calculate it uh, for a period of one year for grid uh, to prosumers before the microgrid and for the grid to microgrid after the establishment of the microgrid. This is the electricity consumption of the community. And this is the uh, production of the photovoltaics of the community. We uh, studied four different scenarios, uh, economic scenarios. The first was with, with batteries and 10% discount on the electricity price from the price that uh, uh, are now the people buy electricity uh, from uh, the main electricity grid. The second scenario is without batteries and 10% discount on the electricity price. The third scenario is without private pumps and without batteries and 10% also discount on electricity price. And the last scenario, uh, we try to find the max accepted uh, discount price for the for the people and this the result was 14.2 percent this is the first scenario with batteries and 10 percent discount on electricity price and we can see from the net present value the net present value is negative the internal rate of return is seven percent lower than the discount rate and this means that the first scenario it is not accepted it is not uh, profitable the second scenario is without batteries and 10 percent discount on electricity price here we can see that the net present value is a positive value and the internal rate of return is 11.7 and this means that uh, this scenario is acceptable and uh, it is profitable the third scenario is without private pumps and batteries and 10 percent discount on electricity price uh, we don't use the private pumps here because uh, the private pumps uh, buy electricity uh, with very low price from the main grid until now and we see that this scenario is very profitable you can see uh, that uh, the the payback period is only three years here the net present value is very high also the internal rate of return is very high and the payback period is almost three years and the last scenario here we try to find the ma maximum accepted discount uh, of the electricity and the maximum accept accepted discount is 14.2 lower than the current electricity price for everybody for this scenario the net present value is positive the internal rate of return is uh, higher than the discount rate and the simple payback period is uh, almost 13 years these are the four scenarios for the greek microgrid and thank you for your attention and uh, i hope to be uh, very short my presentation Wow, yes, nine minutes. No, ten minutes, almost oh, ten okay. minutes. <laughs> I have one. Minute. Thank you, Lectaris. Uh, Thank you. And me for, for keeping it short and to the point. Uh, very good. Uh, so I would like to invite now all our speakers to open their webcams, not share their screens, just the, their webcams. Okay. All the others as well. Anya. Yes, hello again. Hi again. Ian as well. It's opening. Perfect. And Pasquale, are you still with us? Please open your webcam as well. So the, um, everybody's hungry. Everybody's heard for the past one hour and a half a lot of information, legal provisions, models. Um, I'm going to ask a horizontal question, and, and uh, of course, uh, everybody is welcome to to, to uh, ask uh, questions uh, in the chat box as well. Uh, these are the last minutes where you can ask uh, questions to all of them uh, live, and after that, of course, in writing uh, by email. So, uh, 
I'm going to ask, I'm going to start off, uh, so two questions. First one will be a little bit crazy, but still I want a, 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 an answer. Uh, we know that the financial community needs to have some reliable and some repeated models in front of them. How far are we from actually seeing, uh, let's say, a, a, an attempt to, to standardizing microgrids and what steps do we need to take to achieve this, to move forward. So are we talking, do we need more advisory services to test more business models? Do we need more research? To, what do we need to uh, achieve this, uh, this uh, eventual standardization? And I know these are big words, uh, but please. And uh, we can go in the order of the agenda maybe. So uh, I'm putting the spotlight on you, Ian. Uh, feel free to start to answer if you, if you, if you can. Ah, your mic is not open. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I think this is uh, only one aspect of the question because you need to, when you look at, you also need to look at what what the what they deliver. You know, what is the societal value the those energy communities, not only microgrids but energy communities in general provide because there's no point in creating a system which is based on avoiding costs or shifting costs to others so you lower your electricity bill that by itself is not is not a, a viable business model in the long run so part of this discussion how quick does it go how how quick will the rollout be it We'll have to also take into consideration what the societal benefit is that energy communities will bring. And then, Sorry. Please. based on that, it's also a question of, um, yeah, how how big the expansion in total can be, because often they will will be local uh, solutions that are based on local involvement, which puts a limit to a simple copy and paste. Anya, what is your take? Thank you. Thank yes. you, uh, Ian, uh, on your view. What is your take on this? Okay. So, yes, I want to add also, and coming from the funding side, I want to highlight the importance of money in all of this because I can tell you we have a lot of people also um, in the region, so no matter if it's in the city or in a very rural area, people try to apply for a funding for PV installation, for uh, prosumer models. So there, are, there is a very already very high level of awareness. This is what we have learned because we thought also maybe we need to take more actions on educating people that it's important to do energy transition. But uh, in fact, in Austria, as far as we know it, um, people are already there. So especially private pr persons, they want to get engaged now. So what we, well, from the funding side, what I think is the most important thing is to have more budget for funding to enable those communities uh, to happen because the initial costs are high, but we have very often projects that are five or 10 times over signed so we can only fund like 10 percent of all the projects that are valuable of funding so um, we also try at this moment we have a new government building up and we try to push to get more more money more budget to 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 bring this forward so this would be an aspect um i can bring in from our situation mm -hmm. thank you pasquale what would you add to this um to this discussion. But uh, <clears throat> I think microgrid uh, can uh, can offer uh, several advantages uh, and uh, the advantages uh, for uh, the um, consumer involved in the microgrid uh, don't take advantages uh, uh, despite uh, of uh, other consumer 
external to the microgrid. Uh, really, the microgrid. Sorry. Really, the microgrid, uh, as uh, you have seen from the, the presentation, are feasible from both technical point of view and also uh, from the financial point of view, take into account uh, suitable uh, condition that uh, consists of uh, proper incentives uh, related to the advantages that the microgrid are able to determine to produce and also uh, considering possible financial support to the microgrid. In this way, there are a real advantages uh, for uh, a microgrid making use of the renewable resource as from the uh, energy point of view and also from the uh, less cost for the consumer involved in the microgrid. Lefteris, maybe you want to add something on this point? Yes, for the grids, the, the problem is first of all the funding and uh, then uh, the specific regulations on uh, on how the microgrid is going to to work and it is something that uh, we are always waiting waiting as you remember from the from the start of the project specific regulations on uh, on the microgrid and on the energy communities we are still waiting for them mm. yeah okay so we have received uh, thank you all for the for your answers to this uh, to this uh, question uh, so we can see things are moving forward, but it's good to to see that we have active people on the ground working on this and promoting this. Um, we have a few questions. First, we have one question that was asked uh, earlier on by Marie-Louise Pearson, and I promised her that I would ask her at the end. Uh, what do the net owner think uh, about the local energy communities? Very comprehensive. Um, uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, answer is uh, uh, th this question deserves. Uh, but maybe we can have a, a first reaction from one of you on this point. And uh, what do net by net owner? I would uh, imagine it's uh, grid owners think about the local energy communities. And maybe you could broaden this to a more general question um, in your discussions with regulators are you seeing any change in the in the previous uh, period in the past uh, period perhaps from the feedback that we get in brussels from the different associations at first uh, a reaction to our initial proposal and was uh, hesitation and concerns they were afraid to about how this would change the energy landscape and the role of the DSOs. Now I think there's a slight shift and some DSOs see potential opportunities as well in the development of energy communities for them and a new role for DSOs as uh, and what they could offer. But I'm not sure that they already have a clear formal a uh, clear finalized position yes clear formal and finalized positions uh no they they don't seem to have indeed that that is the response i i keep receiving as well uh for now uh so let's take uh we have two more questions here that are written here let's take these two and uh the discussion can continue by other means as well as i said uh, i will share the details of the, our speakers uh with your permission so first uh, uh, another question that deserves a very comprehensive answer uh we won't have time but i'll ask it uh our dso want to switch from energy grid tariffs to capacity grid tariffs which change the business model of local production what kind of grid tariffs are applicable in the different projects Hmm. Pasquale, do, we, do, do you want to, to take this one? <clears throat> As a Easy question, huh? the... <laughs> Please. 
please? Yeah, no, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, as I seen from the different uh, result of the, the different pilot, uh, uh, there are a, a barrier uh, related uh, uh, to the development of the microgrid in connection with uh, uh, the different uh, local situation. Uh, concerning the tariff, uh, it is necessary, as I said before, that uh, the uh, tariff uh, applicable on the, ta on, the, on the microgrid has to be related to the advantages that the microgrid is able to, to put on the table. To, to give not only to the consumer but only to the uh, total electric system, uh, including uh, the SO, including uh, transmission system, and so on, and uh, and also take into account the use of renewable source. In this way, we are speaking about green. Uh, tariffs. Uh, the measure the microgrid made use uh, of these uh, uh, sources, uh, it has to be uh, recognized like uh, happens uh, in several countries uh, for uh, the prosumer producing from uh, uh, PV plant or uh, other. Uh, high efficient solution like uh, co-generator or uh, other means or biomass or so on. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you for this, uh, for this answer. Let's uh, take one last question and this one is for Anya. Joanna asked the question. So uh, she found quite interesting what you were saying. Uh, and she, she's wondering what are the main motivations of people in rural areas versus cities and do any of uh, mm. uh, them try to, to, to assess these motivations and the, the impacts of these technologies projects on the communities? Okay, so um, as far as we know, the motivation for rural areas when I compare to the motivation of, of cities or larger cities is to be independent. So um, they know that they are quite far away from everything. So the infrastructure that they have, they need to rely on it. And this being independent from others is one main driver, which we have recognized. Um, and the other one is also, as they are living very in, in natural related areas. So they're, they know the environmental as, or there are many people who are more environmentally friendly right from the, from their, um in their own motivation already so this also plays a role so we have these two types either they want to be uh autark on energy also which means also even if the prices on an international market they will fall they still can have they have their heat they have their electricity so this part or the other one is a very strong movement for sustainability um, it's interesting because also there there is everyone involved. So you have families, we have women, we have men. You don't we don't have we don't see one group pushing more than others. It's the interesting part that in rural areas there you have these different motivations coming together, and this is why we think the bottom up approach is so important, and why we see that the climate and energy model regions, for example, work so well. Thank you. This is okay. this is. Again, I think I'll quote you some of the time uh, with your permission. It's a perfect uh, conclusion to our, uh, to our uh, uh, webinar, uh, what you just said. I would like to thank our speakers uh, for staying so long and for uh, answering all the questions and for all the information and knowledge they shared. I'm gonna share my webcam now as well and share my screen with you. Um, so, for more outputs from the Pegasus project, uh, feel free to go on our website as well. And uh, also today we're uh, launching the, the latest issue of uh, the Federal Magazine that will focus specifically on energy communities. 
and uh, on the outputs of the Pegasus project. So go there as well, go on our website, go on the Pegasus website. Thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, bon appétit. And I will, of course, send the link to the recording and the slides and the contact details with the speaker's permission to all of the participants. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. okay. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you and goodbye.